welcome to a brand new episode of Malabar Gold, Golden Truth, an initiative by Times of India. Well, in India, the landscape for gold investment is changing rapidly from physical to digital format and digital payments have had a pivotal role to play. Keeping this in mind, we're having this very special discussion with our guest experts joining us on the panel. Allow me to introduce my guest, Richa Mukherjee, Director, Public Policy and Corporate Affairs, PayU. We have Mukul Saxena, CEO of Financial Services, Moby Quick, along with the Mr. Nanda Kumar, CFO Malabar Group and Mr. Gaurav Mathur, MD of Digital Gold India and founder Safe Gold. Thank you so much for joining us on this very special discussion. Ms. Mukherjee, I want to begin by asking you about the use of UPI in P2P and P2M transactions and how it's increased manifold, uh, especially in comparison to you know the use of P2M transactions with regards to credit cards, debit cards, all of that has seen a decline in the recent past. You know, how do you view this in totality and what do you think are the factors that are uh, to be acknowledged given this hike in UPI's popularity? Hi, Kritsveen, and to my fellow panelists, glad to be here. To answer your question, UPI payments such as contactless payments or the card payments, they have thrived since 2016 because of the massive groundwork that has gone due to Jandhan accounts, far-reaching internet connectivity, as well as you know mobile penetration. Uh, at the moment, India has about 60% mo uh, internet penetration, and we can imagine the potential of digital payments from here once we have the internet connectivity in most parts of the country. 2016 onwards, uh, we have seen NPCI facilitating contactless UPI payments via P2P payments, P2M payments on mobile devices. Uh, they were essentially to facilitate the real-time payments. And since then, the number of such payments, both P2P and P2M, have steadily increased, leaving behind the payments done via cards, both debit as well as credit card. Now, 2022 especially has been a very good year in terms of the number of UPI transactions that we recorded. Uh, you know, just uh, like in December itself, there were about 7.8 billion transactions in December and total transactions which were done in uh, the entirety of 2022 was uh, about 74 billion transactions. Now, if you compare this to, uh, you know, previous few years or say 2021, there has been about 90% more transactions as compared to 2021. So we have seen the massive surge in the UPI payment, especially in last two years. And there have been several factors, you know, which have been responsible for this multiple, multiple fold of uh, UPI payment uh, uptick. First and foremost is... Um, the realization by the merchants that they have, if they have to increase their business payments, that can only happen if they increase the adoption of uh, UPI, which is also reflective in the average ticket size of the UPI P2M payments, which has been increasing steadily as compared to the average transaction size of P2P payments. Why the, the main reason, the main advantage of that is the UPI brings convenience. It is very simple to use. It is fast, secure, and anybody can do it any time of the day okay. versus, versus the cards. Uh, just two more points I want to add here is uh, also to do with the fact that newer use cases are continuously being added in UPI, such as offline and online omnichannel modes of payment, whether it is QR payment code, cardless cash withdrawals. They have all added to the innovativeness and, you know, the convenience of the UPI payments. Uh, uh, last and most importantly, amongst all these several factors, uh, one thing which has really impacted the UPI payment upscale is the increased consumer awareness. Uh, okay. Consumers and merchants are increasingly become aware of the of, of this platform. So all of these factors put together have led to the massive upsurge in the UPI payments. Okay, you've put out in front of us a host of aspects that have had a role to play in the gaining popularity of UPI as a digital mode of payment. Uh, so that's a given and topping the list is of course comfort and convenience for all of us here. Uh, but Mr. Mathur, you know, given that this is a unique uh, innovation in itself, it's revolutionary, this whole move, where do you see a stand vis-a-vis -vis the world as far as you know digital financial literacy and penetration is concerned so i think clearly uh, the public infrastructure that we have for payments is probably the best in the world if not one of the best in the world 
Um, I think there are a few other countries which have such public rails or public goods which offer payments like this. As an example, I think in the US, if you have to send instant payments between between countries or even in a country like the UAE, you, you don't have something like the IMPS. So just the basic rails that we built w between RTGS, IMPS is something that's, uh, if not uh, the if not the best, is one of the I'd say top five, top ten sort of payment infrastructure that we have in the world. Now, when you combine that with rising internet penetration, I think geo coming into the country was really the trigger for that. When you have now everyone has a mobile phone, I think mobile penetration is close to 80, 90%. Um, and um, more and more people are getting comfortable transacting online. We will leapfrog a number of generations. I think like most of the West went through card payments and credit card payments as the most dominant form of payment. Uh, we'll probably leapfrog that and just go straight to a host of apps using digital payments. And then you put credit on those apps. You'll put a whole bunch of other financial services on that. So I think we're really blazing our own path. In many other categories, we followed what the developed world has done. Uh, in payments, we are probably the pioneers and, you know, leading the path and others will follow behind us. Okay, all right, great. And I'll talk about the impact perhaps it may have uh, on, let's say, credit cards, debit cards, and we're going to talk about a future innovation as well. But before that, since we're talking about digital payments, we can't not talk about digital gold. In that sense, we've seen a couple of incentives being proposed by the government as well. And I want Mr. Nanda Kumar to come in. Uh, you know, the, sir, the government has been pushing for, for example, the use of sovereign gold bonds, the SGBs. In that sense, some taxation-related incentives have also been announced. They've been offered. But tell us about these incentives. The viewer today wants to understand what is an offer here. So, Government of India has actually introduced this as an alternate to physical investment in gold. So, it has been pushed with a few tax incentives like that. Actually, the capital gains tax is exempted if you are ready to make it to the maturity. Second, there is an annual uh, incentive or either interest payment of 2.5 percentage normally coming in this. Of course, this is taxable. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, for a customer who is investing in sovereign gold bond, mm -hmm. there is no in need of payment GST. So, these three are the major incentives while coming into it. And it is easily tradable and uh, who doesn't want to the touch and feel of gold and who don't want to possess the physical gold of it, and there's who want to follow the GSEC rules. This is one of the good investment options. Okay. And uh, government is consciously pushing this, and they are uh, doing it in a very bad way. And okay. it is actually accepted as a security also. So it is uh, doing all the purpose of a physical gold other than the touch and feel of it. Okay, so it comes with an added advantage of a lot of security as well as what you're telling us. Great. Let's go back to credit cards and debit cards since we're talking about digital payments. Much of us have obviously been relying on credit cards, debit cards all throughout and now most of us using our phones for UPI transactions. Uh, Mr. Saxena, keeping in mind the growing penetration uh, of UPI-based P2M transactions and that's what I began this conversation with, where do you think that leaves open loop cards, credit cards and debit cards both? Uh, first of all, thank you for having Movie Quick uh, on the program. Uh, see, if you look at the year 2022, uh, you know, more than 20 billion transactions, uh, digital transactions were included and uh, with a value of about 36 billion, uh, you know, rupees all put together. And out of this, approximately 34-35% were UPI, uh, you know, in, in its overall uh, strength. Uh, credit card transactions also surprisingly grew, uh, if you look at the data. And uh, it still remains as one of the most preferred mode of transactions, especially for uh, large ticket uh, payments. Uh, so there is still, uh, to my mind, there's still a huge potential for the overall market to grow as the industry is preparing for the next half billion customers who will become digital payment savvy, right? So uh, there is a huge amount of scope for all the payment forms to, ex uh, to coexist. Uh, you know, I believe that the open loop cards like debit credit uh, cards and digital payments will coexist and uh, will drive the growth of the overall payments, uh, you know, uh, pie. While UPI is likely to take an overall lead, uh, as it has already, you know, taken a, a substantial amount of, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, adoption by by the customers. Uh, cards find their relevance in some use cases like transit, ATM withdrawals, and so on and so forth. Last ticket payments, which I mentioned earlier, but UPI because of its inherent ease of use, and of course, uh, you know, as UPI for credit on uh, rupee credit cards becomes more prevalent. It is likely to pose a bigger challenge to the to the cards. 
Uh, however, what is also happening on the open loop cards is that uh, these cards are also now becoming more and more mobile oriented and therefore customers are now easily able to use their cards using the mobile form factor, whether for contactless or for uh, contact transactions. So the friction experience between both UPI and cards is likely to kind of, uh, you know, reduce in terms of its margin. Okay. The economics, of course, are completely different for banks and issuers who issue cards. Uh, you know, they they make money, whereas on UPI right now there is no, you know, there so there is an arbitration arbitrage over there. Uh, all in all, I think uh, just to summarize, I think uh, there is ample space for both uh, UPI as well as other payment forms like cards to coexist. At Mobiquick, we are seeing substantial increase of payments happening both from UPI as well as from debit, credit, prepaid cards and. Uh, uh, and we are hopeful that uh, you know this this trend will continue and will overall grow the digital payments by instead of it being focused around only one payment form. Ms. Mukherjee, you know, can we expect the two to come together, you know, because I'm talking about the credit card linkages to the UPI technology. Can we expect that? And if yes, when? Because that's going to take the UPI technology to a whole new level. It's going to be more and more popular thereafter. Right, absolutely. So, you know, UPI stack, it comprises of UPI, MPS, QR codes, wallets. And one of the key features and advantages is that UPI, it leverages real-time payments, also the real-time settlements for merchants, uh, as against steepless and settlement cycle for cards. Uh, so definitely that's a key advantage. And also recently in October 22, uh, NPCI issued the circular wherein uh, a UPI, the credit cards were linked with the UPI. So it has added a whole new angle from the debit flow in the UPI network to a credit flow as well. So it will definitely help in unlocking a new lever for credit growth for the banks. Also, you know, recently um, the main disadvantage or the low incentive for UPI was uh, the zero MDR, uh, which was there in the market. But to that uh, effect, recently the union cabinet has also approved one year incentive scheme to promote the rupee debit cards and low value beam UPI transactions. So all these factors, you know, are really incentivizing the digital payment ecosystem and beam UPI and rupee debit card. Uh, also, one thing uh, which is a differentiator is that UPI is a simpler process um, of making the payments for online bank vis-a-vis -vis the online bank transfers via IFPS and NEFT. So definitely we can uh, really save uh, you know, a lot of time when we are uh, doing the UPI. You know, Mr. Kumar, with regards to digital gold, now remember both these aspects that we're talking about, digital gold, physical gold, as well as digital payments, all of this in totality is leading us as a country towards you know a hundred percent digital economy which is exactly what the government has also indicated that it intends to do in years to come but according to a recent study titled the financially independent millennial about 33 percent of millennials prefer digital gold over cryptocurrency and other digital assets that's a big number if you look at the larger picture why do you think is digital gold becoming so relevant an alternative investment today the very uh, straightforward is that uh, the millennials who just look at ease of doing things and uh, buying digital gold as uh, nowadays is as easy as you are doing a digital transaction. So you can do it throughout the day. You need not waste your time in traveling as you otherwise purchase uh, physical gold. And secondly, there is no really there is no minimum investment. You can start your investment right from rupee one or rupee hundred, whatever it is. And there is no problem in you having a physical storage and taking security of that. And it is being safely stored elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And your liquidity is also very high in this. As you purchase, you can redeem also. So that is the major points which attract the millennials. Mm -hmm. And it is true also. And they can transact throughout the day from any location. And through the mobile, they can purchase and they can have the uh, physical custody, rather uh, their own uh, physical gold in their custody. 
with the high liquidity so that is the major thing which attracts the millennials nowadays okay and and since you're tracking this pattern sir if you may help us understand you know the kind of popularity that it has already gained amongst the masses what kind of a percentage are we really talking about with regards to the indian population that's invested in indian gold and i want you to also touch upon the aspects of what we just discussed the sgbs and also exchange traded funds and how it's a reflection of the growing affinity of retail and high net worth in net worth individuals towards digital assets because it's easy we've all discussed this not just today but in the past as well it's easy to store physical uh, digital gold it's easy to even transact the transaction is also seamless how much has it already been popular yeah it is the reason survey states around 53% of young people would like to uh, have gold as their part of investment and nearly as you say around 10% of our people who is already uh, holding digital gold that is around 140 million people who has one way or other have accounts in digital gold and around 33 percent of the millionaires who would like to invest in digital gold so today or tomorrow they are coming to invest more in digital gold so the base is very strong now 14 crores people and it is growing in a very high pace so i expect uh, this is going to be our order of future Okay great that's a positive number positive figure so we're really optimistic about what you're trying to point out here sir Mr Mathur Indian government has also launched its own digital currency what revolution do you think that's going to bring in as far as digital payment ecosystem in the country is concerned If you want my honest answer from all I've read that digital currency has no real use case beyond all the UPI and things like that there's a lot of stuff to talk about in terms of um, you know blockchain this that but the heart of it is if you look at digital currencies starting with bitcoin leave aside all the challenges in the crypto sector uh, the essence is that it's a decentralized currency which anyone can run a node and issue it uh, okay. a central bank digital currency by definition is a centralized currency uh, so the only difference is that rather than the database of who has the account sitting with the bank it sits with the central bank Uh, fundamentally as far as the consumer is concerned on honestly i think it's a load of hype with i have yet to read one single even remotely useful use case for any consumer or any business where it helps maybe when you're settling tr- transactions in government bonds and you're doing direct settlements of of the high value transaction everyone has a digital currency account it can help but that's like saying everyone who has to settle transactions on a stock exchange have accounts with the same bank you can settle it immediately so honestly i think it's 99% hype 1% some use case may come out but I don't see any any fundamental change the way it's currently described. Regulations will have to change dramatically. The banking regulation structure will have to change dramatically for it to have any you know disruptive impact uh, in the economy. Okay, so a lot more needs to be done as far as digital currency so far as has been proposed already is concerned. Uh, Miss Bukharji, if we go back once again to UPI, you know the. phenomenal rate at which we've seen uh, it being used it being resorted to by the consumer by the user today is something that we can't not talk about and that's exactly where much of this discussion is centered at this point in time but what really lies in this as far as the upi usage is concerned for banks or digital banks for that matter uh, right so you know for digital banks uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, there are several use cases uh, first is if they really want to expand uh, uh their upi ability f- uh, for the merchants uh, the merchants to use the you know upi they will have to leverage this upi capability uh and uh, as i've also mentioned with respect to the npci circular that will also help in you know leveraging a new lever for credit growth for the banks uh where in npci i mentioned that the uh, all the upi transactions can be linked to the credit cards uh also uh, the zero mdr thing which i mentioned uh wherein the possible linkage of credit cards will allow upi to become profitable operation for banks it will also incentivize banks to issue more credit cards on the rupee network um last but not the least upi is a simpler process of making the payment for online bank transfer visa via imps or nft adopting or scaling upi infrastructure will really help banks offer a better payment related experience to its okay. customers Okay all right uh we're running out of time but a quick answer from Mr Kumar as well because i want to touch upon uh, the budget expectations as well as far as digital gold is concerned your expectations sir from union budget 2023 yeah for digital current gold the major uh, what i would like to command is we need to have a very strong framework operating framework to secure the uh, investor interest in that 
something like a government trustee or something where you are ensuring the safety of the individual investor in the digital world framework. So that is our utmost important requirement from our part, rather the customer's part, to take uh, safeguard the interest of the investors in digital world. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for your point of view. Uh, well, a lot of insights that we've picked up already with regards to digital payments. Of course, the risks involved, we've been able to touch upon that as well and digital gold. All of this, remember, is the future from today and that's exactly why it's been so very helpful with all your insights. Uh, gentlemen and Ms. Mukherjee, thank you so much for speaking to us. Pleasure.